All right, you guys, welcome to our final lecture and the last lecture for this unit. Uh, we will be discussing conservation biology as well as uh, biodiversity. So first we're going to cover biodiversity and kind of the changes in biodiversity that we've seen um, historically as well as kind of present, right? So what causes increased biodiversity and decreased biodiversity as well as what are some of the major threats to biodiversity right now? Uh, but also why is biodiversity important or why is it good to have biodiversity? And then what can we do to combat those threats to biodiversity? And that's really where conservation biology comes into play as well as restoration ecology, right? So this is a great picture um, of a mountain lion near the Hollywood sign because we see mountain lions um, a lot these days and their uh, space is uh, crossing over with our space, right? So this is where um, it affects us, right, um, every day when we see wildlife in our backyards and what can we do about that and um, what should we do about that maybe. So when we're talking about biodiversity, we're really talking about more than just the species level and the individual species. So really we're talking about more ecosystem diversity and the variety of different species that we see in the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So we have talked a bit about the island fox out in Channel Islands um, and what happened to them, as well as the very special Carpentaria salt marsh where we have a lot of very uh, rare species and a lot of biodiversity seen in the salt marsh. So really we have some of these very rare ecosystems around the world and we're lucky to be kind of near a lot of them, including that salt marsh, but just um, the chaparral as well, that, we're, that biome that we live in, holds a lot of endemic species, meaning they only live in these ecosystems. And really when we talk about these, you know, rare endemic species, they can be in danger of disappearing if we don't um, worry about um, biodiversity and kind of taking care of those ecosystems and combating those threats to biodiversity that we'll talk about. So that was ecosystem diversity, but we can also talk about species diversity. And so that's at the species level and you're talking about the richness and abundance of each of these species um, in these different ecosystems. So when we're talking about a species and a population, you can talk about extinction. Right, so if we talk about extinction, that means that no members of the population remain um, of that species, right? So, uh, for example, we have the passenger pigeons that were endemic to North America, meaning they were only found in North America. And they used to be the most numerous bird in America and they would fly in these massive flocks, almost a mile wide and 300 miles long, where it would actually take almost 14 hours for, a, for one flock to just pass over and fly overhead. That means there was close to like 3.5 billion birds. That's a lot of birds. But of course, you know, hunting uh, definitely took them out and there was a final flock in the late 1800s where there was only about 250,000 or about a quarter million left and they were actually killed by one group of hunters who knew that they were the last flock in existence and they essentially did not leave any bird behind which is really crazy that these hunters actually took out 
um, all these birds. So very sad, um, but there is no longer um, passenger pigeons in the world, um, and they were endemic to North America. And they were a social bird, so they used to nest in groups, and so I think they just, uh, their numbers got too low to be able to survive just um, individually since they were such social birds. So um, they are considered extinct now. So when we talk about extinction, it's a very natural process. So we may think that um, extinctions are very rare and maybe they're only happening right now, but in the fossil records, they actually show these very slow extinction rates. So if you look back and our one table here shows about over 600 million years ago, you notice that there are extinctions that are fluctuating and we call that background extinctions. And so that's just kind of slow extinction rates that are happening um, all the time, right? They're just always occurring. But then we have these spikes in the extinction rates and we call those mass extinctions. And so we have had five um, mass extinctions over kind of the fossil records and we're currently considered to be in the sixth mass extinction. And uh, that's really due to uh, humans. So we talked a lot about human population and how it's driving extinction of other species. And so the really the last extinction was about 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, but now we're really into this sixth um, mass extinction. And usually mass extinctions are due to rapid climate change, um, meteorites, things like that, that um, have a very strong effect um, either to the climate and to um, these ecosystems. And so we're losing um, other um, species, right? So if you look at the graph on the right, it's showing kind of these um, cumulative extinctions as a percent of kind of all the evaluated species. And if you notice, we have a, a very severe increase in kind of all vertebrates um, since the 1900s, but specifically mammals and birds. So birds are definitely up there uh, with extinctions. And when you talk about kind of natural extinction rates of birds, you're talking about one every maybe 400 years you have an extinction of a bird species. But lately we're getting one every year for the past 500 years due to humans. So we have definitely increased the bird um, extinction rate significantly as well as mammals and other vertebrates as well. Um, as you can see on the graph. So we have these graphs and things that are kind of um, very subjective. It's really hard to measure extinction rates really accurately. So this is kind of the data that we have because we haven't even identified all of the Earth species, period, right? We've only identified a very small number of the Earth species. So we actually have estimated that there's about 8.7 million species um, on the Earth, and we've only identified and named 1.9 species, not 1.9 million species. And so that's not even counting microorganisms, right? So all the bacteria and parasites, all those microorganisms, we're not even counting in this number. So that is just um, a crazy amount of species uh, to even discover, right? So how can we be that accurate when we don't even know all of the species that exist? Uh, on Earth. So again, very hard to measure these extinction rates. We're just working with the numbers that we have, and it's probably fairly representative of the um, Earth species, but again, you know, we just don't know, right? So when we're talking about extinction, we have some levels um, of 
species diversity uh, coming before extinction, right? So we have species that are threatened, meaning they're in threat of going in extinct at some point if uh, the numbers continue the way they're going. So what are these threatened species that are not necessarily extinct yet? And so we have some different categories. And if you're interested, um, there's a, a, a conservation, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, that actually keeps track of all of the species and, uh, and where they are on this threatened list. And they call it uh, the red list. So that's the red list, meaning um, where are they on this um, on the uh, threatened uh, list, right? So are they vulnerable, meaning they're at high risk of becoming endangered in the wild? So then what is endangered? Well, endangered is at high risk of extinction in the wild, right? And then critically endangered, meaning a very high risk of extinction in the wild. So again, we're talking about the wild and not necessarily captivity, right? Because uh, animals in captivity, uh, a lot of them were trying to combat uh, these threatened uh, species. So if you look, just two examples that we have and maybe you've heard of, right, are the Asian elephants are endangered, so they're at high risk of extinction, uh, but the mountain gorilla are critically endangered, meaning they're at very high risk of extinction. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and check out um, the link and I will uh, put the link on Canvas as well for you guys. So we've talked about ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and now we can talk a little bit about genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is something we have kind of touched on uh, before, right? Which with um, genetic variation and things like that within and between uh, populations. What is that genetic diversity? So this is really kind of the raw material for evolution and adaptation to the environment, right? So if we have genetic diversity and variation, then we can have selection and adaption or adaptation um, with those mutations and things like that to the environment and therefore hopefully um, continue a population, right? The population can survive. So that's really the importance of genetic diversity. But there's some interesting things with genetic diversity, especially for crops as well. So obviously we talk about genetic diversity uh, within humans and within um, you know animals and things like that. But again, there's some great importance for crops to have genetic diversity. And so this example I have here out of UC Davis is that um, there was a there's a new fungus essentially out there that's wiping out the wheat crops in Africa and Central Asia. And so there's actually a resistant gene to that fungus that they found in a relative of the wheat that's over there. And so either they can switch to this relative wheat species and start growing that, or they can use genetic engineering to study and possibly um, transfer the genes from this relative to the current species out there. So essentially, this uh, this specific resistant gene could help fend off um, that fungus um, that's causing such devastation over there. So this may hold the key to kind of the world's um, future food supply, right? So we need to maintain that genetic diversity uh, within crops, within species, within populations, right? We need to have that genetic diversity um, to continue uh, the survival of that species and of that population especially. So let's pause the video and have a little bit of review. So what were those three types of diversity that we just discussed? And what does it mean if a species is extinct versus threatened, right? What's the difference?
So hopefully you guys were able to pause the video and go through that. Should be fairly straightforward. We talked about ecosystem diversity, right? We talked about species diversity, and then we talked about genetic diversity, which is one we've kind of discussed before, right? And so if a species is extinct, that means there are no individuals left of that population or of that species, right? And then if it's threatened, we talked about kind of the different levels of threatened, right? Vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered, meaning that they have a certain level of risk of becoming extinct in the wild, right? So that's the difference between extinct and threatened. So now that we know a little bit more about biodiversity and what it means and why it's important, not only at the genetic species, but also um, ecosystem level, right, to have all this biodiversity. So what are our major threats to biodiversity? What's happening um, right now that maybe we can change or do something about to stop um, the decrease of, of biodiversity? So our first major threat is habitat loss. So this is um, definitely something we see in our area, but all over the world. And that's human alteration of a natural habitat causing this fragmentation of their habitat. So a species is going to have a certain area of um, land, right, that considered its habitat. And that's where it roams and lives and finds its resources for survival. So what do we do? Well, things like agriculture, urban development, forestry, mining, uh, pollution, all of these things are going to aid in habitat loss, right? So these are all um, human alterations of habitat. So for example, um, we've been talking a little bit about the mountain lions in California, and the populations of mountain lions are actually critically low. And a huge cause of this is due to freeways. So freeways are essentially causing a fragmentation of their environment, so they're trying to cross freeways and they're getting hit. And so they're proposing these wildlife corridors, well, all over, but especially over here um, off the 101 freeway at Liberty Canyon to allow animals to actually cross the freeway um, safely in a more natural environment. And what I'll do is I'm actually going to um, link a video of a, a natural uh, corridor that's actually functioning very well in another part of the country. And so we're hoping that maybe we can uh, emanate that and do that over here as well. So it has been proven to work and uh, these uh, SAMO funds are essentially funding to try to get this project um, to come through and actually uh, get built. Okay, so you can check that link out as well if you're interested uh, in the project. So another major threat to biodiversity are those non-native invasive species we talked about. So these are species that are not native to a region and they have been introduced, whether uh, by humans or accidental in introduction so usually they're humanly human introduced but again um, they could maybe be carried by something or something like that but these guys have been uh, introduced uh, to a region they're not native to and they essentially reduce the biodiversity in that area because they lack the environmental resistance of that area they didn't um, they didn't evolve in that region, so they do not have um, the interspecific competition. Uh, maybe they lack predation, right? And maybe they lack the parasites of the area. And so all of these, um, in, these environmental resistances that they um, are able to overcome contribute to their success. <laughs> 
So some examples that we've seen, um, or you know, just other examples, we've talked quite a bit about invasive species, but um, in our area, on our coast, we have um, a non-native ice plant. So if you notice, um, you know, a lot of the coastal lines are covered uh, with this ice plant, and it's actually not native, so it's just taking over, and it's decreasing the biodiversity and pushing out all of the native species of the area. As well as um, this brown tree snake that was introduced to Guam. So they're native to kind of coastal Australia, um, eastern Indo Indonesia area. And so they were actually brought over in a cargo plane in the 1950s to Guam. And now um, they have caused a lot of extinction of the natural um, and native populations of Guam. So there's usually about 13 species of forest birds out there. And when the snake was introduced, three of the bird species are now extinct. Um, four populations in the island are extinct, but they're found on nearby islands. So essentially they have moved um, uh, off the island and gone up elsewhere because of this snake. And now there's, you know, more than 20 snakes in every acre of land. So that's, you know, they're definitely just going crazy, right? They're pushing out all the other native species and they're causing extinction of other species. So they're, they're greatly decreasing the biodiversity. And that's fairly easy to do in an island setting Right, so islands are very susceptible to uh, quick change in biodiversity. So another major threat to biodiversity, which is fairly um, common, right, is pollution. It's something that we all know about, um, and this is definitely caused by human activity. And it can have very local, regional, and global effects, right? So there's a couple examples of pollution. A lot of people know about oil spills, right? So oil spills in the ocean causing detriment to the marine uh, wildlife, right? This poor pelican covered in oil uh, before and after being cleaned. So that's kind of one we definitely know about, right? And then we have what's called biological magnification, meaning that there is um, transfer of these pollutants uh, from uh, terrestrial to aquatic ecosystems, right? So you're, you're releasing all these chemicals um, into the environment and they're going to uh, move up the trophic levels, right? So we talked about trophic feeding levels and what happens is, is that the chemical is going to uh, get more and more concentrated as we increase or go up the, the food chain, up the trophic level. So, you know, DDT was an example of that, but also these PCPs, uh, PCBs, excuse me, um, and they are, uh, what happens is it just keeps increasing um, up the level of the food chain. So these um, high food chain level uh, individuals and animals are getting hit uh, very hard due to this biomagnification. Um, and another one is the ozone depletion, right? So we're releasing uh, these chemicals that thin out the ozone layer and the ozone layer is what protects the earth from uh, UV rays, right? So these harmful UV rays are gonna increase uh, problems such as skin cancer and all kinds of other things as well, right? So we kind of know about that um, too, and the release of carbon dioxide and things like that into the environment. So lots of pollution going on um, that we kind of all know about, right? We know it's happening and we know that it has a lot of detrimental effects on the environment, but also to biodiversity. So another thing caused by humans as well, another major threat to biodiversity is over harvesting. 
So essentially any kind of harvesting that's at a rate that exceeds the ability of that population to rebound or recover. Okay. So this could include plants and animals, right? So any sort of fishing, whaling, hunting, poaching, um, foresting, right? Deforesting. So all of that um, is considered, um, can be considered over harvesting if it's at a rate that exceeds a population's ability to um, recover. So we've seen that with um, mahogany and rosewood trees. So that's an example in plants, but we also see it with uh, tigers and rhinos with poaching, right? So overfishing, over whaling, hunting, all of this can lead to threatened species if that species is unable to rebound uh, from that over harvesting. So our last major threat we're going to talk about to biodiversity is anthropogenic, meaning human caused climate change. And that is a rapid warming of the global climate. Okay. So that means that our global climate um, is increasing in temperature. And so if we talk about greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases, an example of a greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. Um, but we do have other greenhouse gases as well, but the main one a lot of people talk about is carbon dioxide. And Carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases are important because they trap heat in the atmosphere. And they're good to a certain degree because some greenhouse gases make the earth uh, livable or viable, right? So that the earth is not too hot. So we do need a certain amount of greenhouse gases to actually uh, survive on earth, but too much greenhouse gas and it makes it excessively hot, right? So if you trap too much heat in the atmosphere, you're going to increase the overall climate. And so if you notice, you know, this has been a controversial topic, you know, among the general public is the global climate change. Um, but it's not controversial among scientists. And for some reason, you know, graphs and da data just can't convince the general public um, that something is happening. So, you know, a little bit on my soapbox there, but um, in the scientific world, this is not something that should be controversial. It's just a fact. Um, but regardless, right, so uh, we see that we have the highest uh, CO2 concentration since um, about 650,000 years ago. Okay, so we've seen kind of this highest plateau um, of about, you know, 300 on that graph, that brown line, and obviously we have, you know, this cyclical um, uh, increase and decrease of CO2 in the atmosphere. That just makes sense over history, but it's the highest it has ever been um, in this recorded um, history here. So that is telling you something that something is going on, right? We have excessive um, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. And so same with um, our graph on the right hand side, you see this kind of cyclical pattern uh, with carbon dioxide and all these other gases in the environment. And then you see kind of this uh, steep, steep increase um, towards approaching the two, uh, 2000 year, right? So the bottom axis is years, and then the uh, y axis is are the CO2 and methane in parts per million. So we see this rapid increase. And so, you know, we are blaming um, humans for this rapid climate change and increase in climate change, right? So what are some evidence for this, um, you know, global climate change? And we see that it keeps getting hotter each year, right? So we have this increased um, temperature or climate. 
Uh, we know that the ice, the polar ice is melting, right, which is threatening a lot of species up in the polar uh, regions. We have more extreme weather, right? We're seeing that we have more hurricanes, more fire, uh, things like that that can be contributed to, to weather. The sea levels are rising uh, because the ice is melting, right? We're adding more water to the sea levels um, and the wildlife is being affected, right? So these are all kind of some evidence uh, for uh, this global warming. So let's pause the video, right? So you can do a little review what are the five major threats to biodiversity that we discussed in this lecture, right? So obviously there's a lot of threats to biodiversity, uh, but we discussed a few of them. Which ones of those are caused by humans, right? And then um, obviously we're not in lecture, but if you want to pick one, and think, um, you know, to yourself, how can we maybe solve it, right? What could be something that we could do about uh, this threat to biodiversity? What could we change um, to help it, right? So go ahead and pause the video and uh, look through that. We won't go through it just because, you know, it's pretty easy to look back through that, okay? So now that we know the threats to our biodiversity, how can we maybe combat those threats? And that's called conservation biology. So it's really a goal-oriented science, and you're trying to understand and counteract that loss of biodiversity. But you need to understand a couple of things uh, when you're doing conservation biology. So you have to understand the niche of that species. So where is their key habitat? Um, what are the requirements of that habitat for that species? And what are their interactions, not only with other species, but also with humans as well, if humans um, are you know, the main threat uh, to biodiversity? So you really have to know what those threats are that are posed by human um, activity. So you have to assess that situation. So is it deforestation? Is it hunting, um, pollution, whatever that may be that's causing um, uh, the threat to the biodiversity? And then you have to make a plan, right? So you have to design a plan that's going to help expand and protect the resources for that species in that habitat. So for example, I'm sure many of you guys have heard about the giant pandas over in China, and um, they were on the endangered list, right? So there's been poaching and logging um, of their bamboo habitats uh, since the 1960s. And they put a ban on logging um, of the bamboo in about 1998, so not too long ago. And they essentially made these nature corridors between the reserves, between the nature reserves, and they started captive breeding programs to help increase the numbers of the giant pandas. Now you can imagine, obviously giant pandas are quite cute, right? So they were able to really um, do a lot of PR for the giant pandas and really raise a lot of money for this program. So they, it was really a very uh, successful program and they're no longer endangered. Uh, but if you research a little bit about the giant pandas and the programs and how the Chinese kind of use them as PR statements and political statements, then um, there's a whole kind of can of worms there with the giant pandas. But again, right, they're cute and cuddly and everybody wants to help save them. But what about all those endangered species that maybe nobody knows about, nobody cares about, they're not cute and cuddly, and you can't really raise the kind of awareness 
um, in the public eye as you can for some of these other um, species that people really kind of care about. So just something to think about when you're talking about conservation biology as a whole, right? What kind of species um, are people trying to help? So what are some of the big goals of conservation biology? So we want to do habitat preservation, right? So we want to have these core reserves um, to protect these habitats that the species live in. And so what happens is, is they're protected from high impact human use. So essentially they ban things like logging or hunting or things like that so that um, we have this core reserve for that species. But then again, you may have this fragmentation that happens um, where their habitat is split up, right? So in those cases, you want to make corridors that are co going to connect those habitats that the animals and even uh, hikers can use them too. So, you know, if these core reserves are not connected, they get this fragmentation and that can definitely be detrimental. So we talked a little bit about the mountain lions in Southern California. Um, in the Santa Monica Mountains. So that's really kind of what's happening um, just kind of in our backyard, right? So again, you can see what's happening just in our own area and um, what they're trying to do about it and create those corridors for uh, the mountain lions in kind of the Agora Calabasas area. So another way that conservation biology tries to help, um, you know, maintain biodiversity and um, restore biodiversity is focusing all of their efforts on these biodiversity hotspots. And what are these hotspots? They're actually geographical locations that contain a high number of those endemic species, meaning that um, they, these species only live in that kind of environment, that kind of habitat, um, that kind of biome, right? So we've seen that word endemic species before. So take California, for example, we are a biological hotspot. So we talked about that chaparral or Mediterranean biome uh, being kind of very um, important for endemic species and being kind of this biological hotspot. So if you notice, kind of looking at the map here, we have 34 kind of identified biological hotspots. A lot of places make sense, right? Like Brazil, uh, Costa Rica, Central America, you know, the Pacific Islands, things like that, even the ocean, right? So um, the Pacific Ocean, Mediterranean, so New Zealand, kind of all these places that um, they, they take up only about one to two percent of the Earth's land, but they contain 60 percent of the world's species. So that means over half of, you know, the species that we've identified anyways. And many of those species are endemic, meaning they only live in that environment. So if you can focus kind of your energy and resources to these biodiversity hotspots, you have a better chance of, um, you know, keeping or maintaining or even restoring uh, the biodiversity in those regions. So if we saw on that map, Central America definitely is a biological hotspot. And so within Central America, Costa Rica, um, the country of Costa Rica is really a great model for commitment to conservation. They put a lot of energy um, into um, conservation biology and biodiversity. So they really encourage sustainable practices in their country, ecotourism, um, meaning bringing the, um, the, the, the tourism, um, bringing it out into the public eye, right, and showing off like what you're doing and um, being able to have people come see um, that the type of biodiversity in the area. And they really put a great deal of value on biodiversity. So it means a lot to them and they really care about maintaining and sustaining their biodiversity. 
So 25% of Costa Rica is protected, which is great. So if you look at the map, um, there's national parks and reserves all over the country. And so they really are trying to do a lot of work um, in the conservation biology world. And it's a beautiful place. If you've never been to Costa Rica, I highly recommend it. That kind of goes with that ecotourism idea, right? So we've talked a bit about why we care about biodiversity and why biodiversity is important, but why is conserving biodiversity important? It's very similar, right? We benefit from biodiversity as a species, right? So it's kind of a selfish reason to care about biodiversity. Obviously you can, there are many, um, you know, selfless reasons, helping the animals and the environment and all of that, but ultimately that helps us as well because we get direct benefits uh, from biodiversity. So we get natural substances, right, such as oxygen and water. Obviously we need clean water, we need oxygen to survive, we need food, right, so animals, agriculture is all coming from, you know, animals and plants. We get wood, right? So logging wood is very important um, in our world, but also things like medicine. So you may not think about it, but a lot of plants have medicinal purposes. And so just for an example, things you would never think about is this Madagascar periwinkle. I have some in my backyard. They're quite pretty. Um, actually has a medical substance called vincristine. Um, and vincristine is um, also a brand named Oncovin, which is a chemotherapy agent. So it's really the main treatment for leuke leukemia, um, especially childhood leukemia, as well as Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is crazy to think about that, you know, one of the main chemicals for uh, chemotherapy is coming from plants right? So lots of medical reasons why uh, we need uh, biodiversity in plants. Um, another reason, right, is the, um, is recreation, right? Keeping our nature uh, preserves and wild um, and things like that, that we can utilize, right, for our own enjoyment. Um, but also going back to kind of agriculture and food, um, if we don't have the biodiversity, we talked about kind of genetic diversity earlier, right, in our last lecture. And similar thing that's happening with the wheat um, over uh, in, um, in South America and things like that is the potato famine happened. So there was really only one uh, type of potato in Ireland and they really you know sustained themselves on potatoes and what happened with the potato famine is when the potato that type of potato got a disease it really wiped out all of the potatoes and then therefore wiped out a lot of people as well that were depending on those potatoes so if they had had a different type of potato um, biodiversity maybe there would have been a potato that was resistant uh, to the disease that the potato had um, in Ireland. So just kind of an idea there where, you know, agriculture and things like that are very important um, for biodiversity. So not only do we get direct benefits like food and water and medicine, and things like that, but we also get some indirect benefits as well. So these are gonna be supporting benefits, such as soil formation. So the soil is really gonna help recycle nutrients. So there's microorganisms that are really important in the soil. Uh, we have decomposers and um, those detritivores that break down the wastes and help with um, soil formation and important soil or good soil is very important for um, you know plant uh, health right so plants not only in the wild but also for agriculture too so that's kind of indirect right so it's not the plant itself but the soil that the plant is growing in
we also have erosion and flood control. So plants that are going to block wind, um, uh, you know, roots that are going to stabilize the soil and increase water uptake, things like that. So, um, you know, they try to hydro seed and hydro mulch after uh, fires, right? That's that green stuff and sometimes maybe uh, different colors that they uh, blow onto the soil so that they hopefully can uh, restore the um, plant life uh, in the soil after a fire. Uh, also, we have climate regulation, right? So plants, um, communities of plants provide shade, reduce the temperatures, they help uh, wind breaks, things like that. They take up CO2. All that is very important for creating, you know, a good environment for not only other um, plants, but also um, other animals as well. And then genetic resources, right? So genes that we can transfer or breed into to our crops that are gonna help with nutrients, growth abilities, things like that. So kind of that genetic engineering we've talked about before. So these are all kind of indirect benefits that kind of go along with our direct benefits. So what happens when we do lose biodiversity? So we've talked about our threats to biodiversity, we've talked about conservation biology, how do we combat those threats, but what actually happens when we lose that biodiversity? So hopefully you guys were able to do this assignment last week and research a little bit about the Yellowstone um, wolves in the National Park and what happened uh, when those wolves were hunted, um, you know, not to almost to extinction, but very, very low numbers to where um, we, we, you know, almost removed the wolves from the trophic feeding levels, right, out of the ecosystem. And so what happened are, are the elk population really um, increased, right? So the wolves usually hunted and, and ate the elk and kept their numbers in control. So the elk population just ballooned and really overgrazed a lot of the land and trees uh, such as the willow and aspen. And so with this decrease in the trees, it led to a loss of biodiversity and a loss of habitat for a lot of songbirds. But it also lost a uh, food source for beavers and um, resources to build their dams. And without the beaver dams, then you're affecting the water quality and the biodiversity within the water ecosystems as well. So it was this huge cascading result um, of a loss of biodiversity within Yellowstone National Park. And they realized this, and so then they reintroduced gray wolves to try to um, restore the trophic uh, cascade and that natural balance um, of all the species in the ecosystem. And so we do consider the, the wolf a keystone species in this ecosystem because they increase biodiversity. So remember keystone species are um, positive and they increase biodiversity and without them you get a loss of biodiversity. So here's just what um, happened, right, that we just discussed with the gray wolf in Yellowstone National Park. So you can read through that and how um, it affected the entire trophic cascade um, that we just discussed. And hopefully you guys were able to um, talk about this a little bit last week as well. So after talking about all this conservation biology and threats to biodiversity and why it's so important to try to maintain and increase biodiversity, what can we do as individuals, right? Obviously there's gonna be a lot of organizations out there that are um, really dedicated to conservation biology. And if you're interested in it, then I definitely recommend, you know, doing a lot of research and seeing if there's any um, you know, groups or anything that you can join, um, organizations that you can join to, to help um, uh, restore uh, biodiversity. 
but what can we do, right? Just in our everyday life, you can kind of just pay attention to your own biophilia. Biophilia is just the love of nature. So just pay attention to your own opinion and, and feelings on nature. Um, you can support sustainable practices, right? So you can get involved or at least research um, organizations that promote sustainability and you can support those groups and organizations. So, you know, things like going organic, things like that. There's a whole seafood watch where you can actually um, you know, certified sustainable seafood. So how the seafood is caught and everything that's a big one because right now there's a huge um, loss of biodiversity in the oceans due to overfishing, that over harvesting problem that we discussed er earlier. So if you know kind of what types of seafood to look out for, um, that can just be something that you do when you're, you know, you just be more cognizant of it. Um, a big thing that they're trying to do in agriculture is kind of shift from, uh, you know, this competing with nature idea to more a partnering with nature um, for agriculture. So you're trying to protect um, that soil uh, formation and things like that. You're trying to have a little bit of diversity in the plants that you're growing together. What kind of plants help each other out? Um, you know, which plants help the soil? Things like that. So this this kind of a shift in the idea of um, agriculture is is big right now as well. So just getting involved and seeing what's out there is just all we can really do if we if we care. So that's you know, just a little uh, food for thought for you guys in this lecture. So hopefully uh, you guys learned a little bit this semester and hopefully are a little bit more aware um, of what's out there and what's in your environment, what's in your world. Um, and I really enjoyed teaching you guys. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, good luck with everything you do.